Good morning everyone to the northeast of South Africa, the Sabi Sands, specifically Juma Game Reserve. This morning it is Sam Chevalier and Dave behind the camera and hopefully we'll be bringing you all sorts of beautiful things to see and talk about today. We are currently at the Hyena Den just on Aubrey's Road and it's a little bit inactive at the moment but it was active just a couple seconds ago. So if we, ooh, you can actually see in the distance, there is a hyena just there. Hello, friend. He's just behind that, that feather top chlorus grass that is covering his head. But great camera work from Dave. We have had such exciting experiences with hyenas lately and we thought, let's come to their home and actually just say hi to them at their home. Because yesterday, two days ago as well, we were sitting with Tingana in, with a kill in a tree and hyenas were underneath Tingana with its kill and wow, it was so much action. Well, to be honest, the hyenas were just sitting underneath the tree waiting for anything to fall down. Eventually, two, two bones fell down and the hyenas jumped on that as quick as they could. But what I was quite interested in is, you know, where were those hyenas from? Were they from this den? And did the mothers and the others come back with some of the bones and feed it to the youngsters? Because often that's exactly what they'll do. And the youngsters will stay in the den. The mothers will sniff, sniff out any kind of old carcass that is out there, get some of the old bones and bring it back to the young, young uh, cubs that are here at this den. You can just see his ears poking out by, on the next of those grasses. <laughs> but I can tell you, it is a beautiful morning. Chris Rogue and Lucy said that they saw Tungana on the dam cam last night. Yes, we, we, got, that, um, we got that update. Uh, Brent and James are out at the moment. James is on the tracking team to see if he can go and check Gallego shortcut to see if there's any tracks of Tungana this morning. And Brent is off to the further to the east to see if he can find tracks. We decided to come to the hyena den on the way to look for tracks because this is the best morning to, well, the best time of day other than the evening to view the hyenas. Oh, there we go. And we haven't seen the hyena den for quite some time. And I know that a few people have been dying to see the hyenas. So we thought we'd come through, say good morning, and then show everyone the, the most incredible sky that's out at the moment. Just while they go around the back, show them those colors it's incredible there's purple there's red there's violet there's blue it's a magnificent morning here in the bush and hopefully the sun will poke its head above the horizon and we'll see a beautiful red sun in the african sky with the hyenas but we're not going to be staying long here with the hyenas as we would like to track tungana and see how tungana is going so with that we're going to head off because the hyenas have just gone behind the shelter there. So we'll head off and see if we can find Tugana. On that note, let's go and see how Brent is doing out there and seeing if he's finding any tracks. We're not going to link right now because we're going to sit here and see if we can find a little bit more of the hyena. Brent's got some bad signals, so you're going to have to stick with me and Dave for now. <laughs> But to be honest, me and Dave have been getting some good action in the future, or well, in the past. So hopefully we can bring some more. Maybe if we could come around this hyena den just a little bit, we'll be able to see their heads poking up. Yeah. It doesn't look like they're there. I think they're on the other side of the mound. But they're very, very sleepy and docile, so I'm going to leave them and not irritate them too much. We've had a good, good morning. I think it's time to see if we can find tracks of Tungana and have a look at this incredible sunrise that's about to be upon us. There we go. 
So we were all at the kill of Tungano last night, two days ago, myself and Dave were there, and it was incredible. We were just sitting there watching the carcass. We were just looking at the carcass to see, you know, what, how it killed, how much of it had Tungano eaten already, and it was incredible. We didn't even see Tungano coming, and next thing he jumped up onto the tree and started feeding on the kill. That's something, I haven't seen that before. I've never seen in my life, you know, a, a cat feeding so close to me. It was, it was honestly incredible to see the kill itself and to see those bite marks that were inside the kudu. It was spectacular. With that, Brent's got some signal. Let's go see how he's doing. Good morning and welcome to this beautiful sunrise. And we're on the safari, a live African safari. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have Brian Joubert. And sometimes we are called the killer bees. Killer bees. But Brian, so let me just turn this. Let me just turn that down for a second. Brian, how are you feeling today? Old, yes. decrepit. Oh, Brian has joined in Zulu what we would call the Gugile and Pugile Club. And uh, translation is old and broken. Brian is now 30 years old and um, he's feeling a bit old this morning. <laughs> Don't worry, Brian, I've been feeling old for a few years already. But we've heard a report that there might be some cheetah on in Coral heading south. So we are almost down the cheetah plains now and we're going to go check that northern boundary, see if we can find any tracks or even better, a cheetah. So we had uh, good fun at the conspiracy theory party and uh, a few of you are wondering what we went as. Brian went as? The king of flat earth. I went as the shooter on the grassy knoll uh, and uh, James went as chemtrails. Kirsten went as uh, the lunar landing didn't happen and what if VM, VM didn't go as anything? He was a Loki. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we have wore a tinfoil hat, I forgot about that. Um, that was that, was that a lurky, is that cell, cell phones fry your brains or people yeah, are trying to mind control? Light in the sky, yes. not sure. Yeah. <laughs> and Alex uh, went as the dark side of the moon. And that's about it. Steph went as Steph. Oh, but it was uh, very fun. Who went as Lady Gaga? Sorry, Farm Control said someone went as Lady Gaga. I didn't... Oh, Louise went as Lady Gaga. I'm not quite sure how that's a conspiracy theory, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll just leave that at that. But it is quite interesting, and it also sparks a bit of con a conversation around camp <coughs> about what's true and what's not. I was really surprised no one went as Elvis. I thought we'd definitely have one Elvis in our crew, but no, it didn't happen. Second, uh, Chris Rogue says Brian Joubert is aging like a good wine. Thank, thank you, Chris. Thank you. I think, Chris, I think you've made Brian blush. So, wonderful morning. There's a little bit of low mist hanging about. A bit chilly. As you can see, I've got my jacket on. And we're on that cusp between winter and summer. So, even though it's getting really warm, over 80 Fahrenheit during the day. The mornings, it's just that little nip in the air that lets us know winter is on its way. I'm very excited for this winter for lots of different reasons. Of course, we've got Traverse at Cheetah Plains and we're going to have quite a lot of... Oh, sorry, I just need to... Listen.
Sorry, I'm just listening. Uh, there's some guys following up on this Cheeto and Coro. I'm trying to get an update. Sorry, guys, I'm just trying to listen to this. It's, it's a busy radio this morning. Sean, Sean. Sean, sorry, I didn't copy that update. What uh, were you following up on? hear him. Wait, I think we need to get further to the east and the comms will get a bit better. But we have been having some spectacular sightings and if we can find a cat today, it's day 12 in a row. So the streak is on. We're still a long way off that. What was it? 29 days in a row. But we are definitely working on it. Dina thinks it's definitely time for more cheetah and I couldn't concur more, Dina. So we're going to definitely scour the area and hopefully we have some luck with the tracks or even better, the animals. So I've got to go through a little dip here and we might lose signal. Oh, but first. Morning, morning, morning. morning. Hi, you, F. Good, how are you? Sharp, I heard, I can't really hear nicely on the gut and the radio, but I thought that we were talking about Shikankank and Konzo and Koro side somewhere. That's the Ingwe. Is it Ingwe? That Ingwe. In Kanyi, no? No, it's my daughter Ingwe. Okay. And also, like, you said, like, a chili con, chili con, my daughter in Ghana coming this way. Yeah, I, I, I saw it that side. I think I'm trying to try to say the Juma game side. Okay. It can be better. I will go around this way. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mufo. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Bye. Cheers guys, enjoy. So there's also tracks on the line. You probably I'm not even sure if he's ever been on camera. So we've just been with the hyenas and we're not far away from them now. We, we were on Albury's and now we're on Gallego Shortcut and we're just looking for tracks to see if we can find Tungana. We know that Tungana was in the area. So we're just looking for any, any kind of sign track of the male leopard to see if he's moved off the property or if he's gone into the thickets here. So we're just searching everywhere. Alan from New Zealand is asking, what is the, my most, uh, most fascinating animal to view and study? Wow. Aaron, can, just can you give me 10 seconds on that one? I just want to think about it. I want to think about that. Hmm. You know what it is? came straight to my mind after I said that. My favorite bird is, you know, which intrigued me about, about the bush, is the kingfisher. I love kingfishers so much. I don't know if you guys have any kingfishers where, where you are in the world. If you do, I'd love to see a picture. But I'll have a look actually to see if there are any in New Zealand. But the kingfisher's got such a unique design in terms of the way it flies, the way it catches catches animals but also uh, the difference between the, the the ones that are migratory and the ones that are here in southern Africa and just watching them and watching the way in which they fly because they flitter I mean I used to live on the uh, live on the banks um, of the Cedarberg River just for, for, for a time and I used to sit there and watch the giant kingfisher which is a beautiful big bird that has a big big snout 
or a big beep, sorry, snout would be the very, <laughs> the wrong word for that. But that was my favorite bird to study from a biomimicry point of view in terms of how do you design systems that can go from one to another so efficiently. Uh, I thought that was incredible. But to be honest, Aaron, like, my, my, my field of interest is ecology itself. And I find that ecology, you know, when you start looking at all the different intricacies of the natural world, from a plant to an animal to a bird, you can begin to understand and unravel its own genius. They all have a unique way of living on this planet. Oh, look at that. It's so beautiful. I know I just showed it to you a couple seconds ago, but it's just getting brighter and brighter, these different colors in the sky. So I'm just going to bring you through the sunrise. We've seen the first stage. This is the second stage of the sunrise. Again, I'll go down into a dip, so we won't be able to see that sunrise, but we're going to get to a place where, where Dave knows it's quite a good place to show the sun coming up into, into the area. We're back. Sorry about the disappearing act that we pulled in the dip, but we are now heading along the northern edge of our Cheetah Plains Traverse towards Three in a Row Pan. Now, not only are the cheetah something we might find there, uh, there could be Mr. Quarantine, there could be a male leopard, Shavamba Lion, who's one of Karula's offspring. Uh, they could be in Canyon, so lots of stuff happens around that area especially now as the water dries up in the surrounding bush three in a row pan becomes a really important spot A huge welcome to Gonzalo, who's in, who's in Argentina. I think this might be our first Argentine viewer. So welcome to Safari Live, Gonzalo. Uh, Gonzalo's wondering in what country are we coming to you from? And is it a national park or an animal reserve? Well, Gonzalo, we are in South Africa. We're on the eastern edge of South Africa in a province called Mpumalanga. And in local lingo, Mpumalanga means where the sun rises. So we're right in the east. Uh, we are in a private reserve called the Sabi Sands Game Reserve, more specifically at this very moment. Uh, I am on Cheetah Plains Private Game Reserve. Now, it isn't a national park. As I said, it's private land, but there's no fences between us and the national park. So animals are able to traverse freely over about 9 million acres. So the Kruger National Park is about a kilometer and a half uh, to the east of us. We might a little later but a big welcome to Gonzalo who's joining us for the, the first time so Gonzalo is sitting in Argentina and enjoying a live safari in South Africa so we're coming up to quite an important place there's often a lot of thoroughfare of animals in this area so let's So, <laughs> I'm not sure how this tradition started at Safari Live, but it is now very much a tradition. It was started by Zodwe and Tandi, who, when it's your birthday, attack you with a bucket of water. So, being nighttime last night, uh, Brian got his bucket. Cheryl was wondering if he did. Uh, and uh, I apologize again, Brian. 
I was chosen as the man to dispense the bucket because I was tall enough to get it over his head. Most other people in camp would have thrown it at his midriff. So Cheryl, yes, Brian got his bucket. And uh, I think everyone was quite nice. They gave him warm water instead of cold. Although I will admit, if someone dumped a cold bucket of water over me on the edge of winter, I might have a sense of humor failure. Warm, you can sort of forgive. Please forgive me, Brian. I'll forgive you. Ah, oh, thank you. It's good fun. <laughs> So, Brian was wearing his crown that was covered in a blue glitter. So, when the bucket of water went over his crown, and um, Brian has still got blue glitter in his beard and everywhere. So, uh, it, was, it was quite funny. So, while we move towards three in a row pan, let's go have a look at the stunning African dawn with Sam. Take that in. That is just the best thing I've seen all day. I know it hasn't been a long day, <laughs> but that is beautiful. Jeepers, look at that. It just doesn't even look real. It looks unreal. <laughs> look at the colors on that sun. The bright yellow all the way down to the to the pink red at the bottom of it. Wow. You can just see a red. It's wow, I don't think I've seen a sunset like I'm in mean a sunrise like this. Oh, it's just we're just gonna give this just another five seconds. That's, I could just stare at you all day. <laughs> all right, Erin from New Zealand said that they have a sacred kingfisher. That's amazing. Please send us a picture if you can of what it looks like. I would love to have a look at that sacred kingfisher and learn a little bit more about it. Apparently you've already done that. I'll have a look at it later and put it in my books. So here are the ones that we get here. So I've seen the malachite before, which is a very, very small kingfisher that I've seen down by the rivers. You'll just see it in the waterine areas. You'll just catch a, a glimpse of this magnificently colored bird. And it's very much like the pygmy. So the pygmy and the, and the malachites are similar, but the pygmy is a little bit bigger than the malachite. Um, but the, the distinguishable feature is this purple on its neck. I mean, they are very, very different, the two. But they, they, both of them are my favorite kingfishers, without a doubt, just because of their color. I mean, I said the, the giant is, but in terms of, I mean, they're all my favorite. What am I talking about? Every single one of these kingfishers are my favorite. But this is the one that we get quite often here. And the sound goes like this. Uh, that was the best, the, the best one I could do. I could, I'm not very good at whistling, but that is the Woodlands Kingfisher. And of course we get many other different kinds, but I'm not going to bore you this morning on all the different kingfishers. We'll hopefully find them and we'll talk a little bit more about them. The moment we are on tracks of Tungana, so we're just going to see if we can find some tracks. We've seen loads of hyena tracks. The hyenas have been exceptionally active, but of course they've there's been a number of kills uh, around the area, so the hyenas have been active, getting around, seeing if they could find... Ooh, what was that bird that just flew in there? It was a... Imagine that. So I just saw a very bright colored bird flew into that bush. It would have been exciting. James Richard, when is my birthday? Well, it's on the same day as my brother's. <laughs> so he was born two minutes 
before me, so he's older than me. And his birthday is on the 17th of May. So my birthday's in May, just in just less than a month now. Yeah. So I'll be here. I'm only going on holiday in, in around June. So you're going to be seeing a lot of me for the next while. Not so long until my birthday, turning 26. Getting, getting growing up in the world a little bit, so. Okay, let's go up here. We're going to see if we can find some tracks up here. This is now quarantine. Quarantine is such a beautiful place to come, especially as the sun rises over quarantine. And you just, it's a nice open area, so you can see in, a, in the distance, have a look for anything that might be lurking behind the bushes. Yo, look at that sun through the tree. Sorry, guy, I keep looking at the sun, I know. But it just keeps drawing me in. It just keeps drawing me in. I'm like a, a moth to a light. But I'm not going to look there anymore. I'm going to look for tracks because we want to find Tingala. Okay, let's link to Brent while I get down on these tracks to see if we can find something. Let's see what Brent's up to. So, I've been looking at that glorious African dawn with sand and we are almost about to come onto one of the big open areas of Cheetah Plains and you can see the bright, at the moment, orange orb rising above the eastern horizon. It's hard to imagine that that star is nearly five billion years old. And it's a little dwarf star. It looks so big to us and it's so important in our lives and in our world, but in the greater universe, it's a, a quite a little star and a tiny speck of what else that's out there. Sorry, just listening to the end drive again. I'm trying to get an update. I'm feeling like New Leopard today, Brian. I got that, that, that... I don't know how to describe it. It's that, that feeling in my gut, we're going to see something. Or some, a leopard we haven't seen before. It seems like Argentina is catching on to Safari Live and we've got another viewer from Argentina, Marco. Welcome, Marco. And Marco would like to know how many types of feed lines are in the reserve. Well, apart from the obvious big three, which are lion, leopard and cheetah, we have a caracal, serval and African wildcat. So six feed lines that occur in the Sabi Sands Game Reserve. Oh, excuse me. Lots of dust out this morning. Now we're in search of felines at the moment. Looking for cheetah, hopefully. We're about to come out into the open and look towards the Kruger. I love these mornings with the mist. It's just absolutely spectacular. Beautiful morning. Some buffalo. 
out on the clearing where they've been spending the night as well. Buffalo in the mist. And if we look carefully, you can even see when they breathe the warm air. Uh, so you see them lying down like that, those horns. You can see what a formidable, a formidable barrier that they can provide if they are harassed by lions. And we're going to get to those buffalo. I don't think they're going to move to any time in the near future. I just want to go check along the northern edge of our traverse area and then I'll loop back towards those buffalo. Hi, Lucy, who's in South Bend, Indiana. Lucy would like to know, is three in a row pan man-made or natural? Well, Lucy, it's a bit of both. That's the funny one. Uh, I think it was a natural depression uh, that they added a, a pipeline to, to to pump water and then they've dug it out a bit. So uh, it, it started off as natural. Uh, well, it's, a, it's a combination, let's see if it's that. Check very carefully through here. We're talking about the different felids or felines we get out here. And Roger says, what is an African wildcat? Is that like a feral cat? It's not, Roger. It is a, a wild indigenous species. It is the ancestor of the domestic cat. And all domestic cats came from wildcat stock. And the first place to domesticate them was ancient Egypt. Now, on the southern side of Cheetah Plains, we have a friend known as Gnormless Gnormin the Gnu. And we're about to see Gnormless Gnormin's rival. Uh, this is the other wildebeest bull that moves between here and towards Cheetah Plains Pan. And that seems to be the boundary between him and Gnormless. But he also visits north and goes to Nkoro. Wildly beast. Off on a morning patrol. short grass plains. See his tail working steadily trying to keep the flies at bay. So this isn't Gnorman, this is Gnorman's rival. We'll go look for Gnorman a little later. We're going to continue. We're quite close to the northern edge of the traverse, but before we go there, uh, Roger, that is a wild cat. Generally quite a lot more long-legged than uh, the domestic cat. Now one of the biggest threats 
to African wildcats is domestic cats because they taint the genetics. Sean, Sean. Morning, what you following up on? Okay, just gonna have a morning meeting with Sean. While I have my meeting, let's jump back across to Sam and see what he's up to. So you've been sitting with some buffalo and some wildebeest with Brent. And now you are sitting with a very, very interesting tree that we have here. And have a look at those thorns. Wow. I mean, I was walking yesterday in the bush just to get from A to B and I stepped on one of these and I went straight through my shoe and into my foot. It was probably the most uncomfortable experience I've had in a long time. But what is so magnificent about these, looking at these type of trees, is just to understand, you know, it's the fence system. And this tree defends itself from, from all sorts of herbivores because obviously it's getting grazed by some very, very big animals out here. So its defense mechanism is, is mechanical. It uses these to protect itself. Whereas the other plants that we get, some other plants that we get are like the silver cluster leaf, use chemical defense. So within the leaf itself, it has tannins. So when uh, an animal tries to eat it, it tastes those tannins and it just yeah, it deters them away from it. So it's so interesting to see the way in which animals will defend themselves and the way in which plants will defend themselves. And this tree that we have here, have a look at the bark that is just behind it. Look how flaky it is. You can see how flaky that, that, that bark is. So this is a flaky thorned acacia. But I've been told that the name of acacia has actually changed um, over the past while. So I'm not, I'm not sure what the new name is for an acacia. I think it's a senia or something like that. But last thing to say on this tree is I have a, a nice little something along those lines for the new acacia. I'll definitely start trying to mention it more what it is, the new name for the acacia, but have a look at this leaf structure. And so I've actually compiled a little list of all the different types of leaves that you get. And so what I would categorize this into is a compound leaf. So you go number two, compound leaf. If you have a look at a number of trees wherever you are at home, you'll see there are simple leaves a lot of simple leaves, but when you come to trees like this that have a number of number of leaves coming off one stem is a compound leaf. And over here we can see that it is, look, it's coming off evenly. One, two, one, two, one, two, and then also they're coming off evenly. So I would say that the leaflets are paired and it's, yeah, the leaflets are paired. Um, but if you have a look here, it says that it could be bipinnate. So look, look at how, how different those ones are. So that's coming off one by one. This is coming out and going like that. So it is, it, I would say that this leaf structure is bipinnate. Oh. Anyway, so that's just an interesting little way in which we can identify trees because it is Earth Day tomorrow. Tomorrow is Earth Day. How very exciting. And I think it's an opportunity for us to learn a little bit more about the trees that live on our planet. And something that I really want to, you know, say because of Earth Day being tomorrow, is let's try and do something for our Earth, whether it's plant a seed or start, you know, recycling water so that we can grow our own vegetable garden. Earth Day is an important day for us to remember that the Earth is constantly giving us everything that we need from water to oxygen. So I'm going to be starting a garden just outside my room tomorrow so that lots of butterflies might come to my room, little insects. So I'm excited to do something for Earth Day tomorrow. But we carried on... We carried on the other road to see if we could find tracks of Tungana. Tungana's tracks have been lost. Uh, Brent and other people will be looking 
to see if they can find tracks of Tungana. But if you do, oh wow, have a look at that. There's birds on top there. What are those? Look like hornbills from here. Yes, they are hornbills. Those are the African grey hornbills. We've already got that on our bird list, so we're not going to write that down. But on that note of Earth Day, if you guys have any plants that you want to plant or anything that you do, whether it's a tree, plant, vegetable, please take a picture of us. Hashtag Safari Live. We would love to see what, you, what you're being up to over there. With that, let's go see what Brent's up to with an elephant. from Kristen? Nope. Yeah, it comes out a bit bad in this little dip here. We are back on the road. Have a look at that open area. There are no animals out there. We've just seen the African grey hornbill. We've seen an amazing sunrise. The sun is starting to get a little bit bright out here. And myself and Dave are quite keen to find an elephant now. So we, we heard elephants moving around this area just now. So we're trying to listen to see if we can hear them. How cool would it be to just listen and sit with some Ellie's for a bit under this beautiful morning? All right, here we go. We are now on Rebecca Road. I feel like I'm learning a little bit more about this bush every day. I can't tell you how my confidence has increased by just knowing the roads. Like when I was driving around here, I didn't know what was going on. If I found something, I'd be like, I found an animal. <laughs> Couldn't tell everyone where it was. But there's tracks now of Ellie's, there's that movement. I, I went out the car the other day to show everyone what it looks like to be an elephant. I tried to be an elephant. Didn't work very well. But its trunk has been scraping the ground here. Let's see if we can find it. Please, wherever you are in the world, if you I know it's not going to be morning where you are, but when your when your sun does rise, I would love to see what it looks like on your side of, of the world today. Because this morning was just the best sunrise I've, I've experienced in a long time. I'm not going to keep saying I've ever experienced, but it was beautiful. Brent is back. Let's see what he's doing. We'll see you just now, hopefully with an elephant. So we are busy looping back towards that big herd of buffalo. And we've also seen a herd of elephants moving towards that pan as well. So, very exciting. Uh, I think they're heading for a drink and they've just come out of the Kruger. So it'll be very exciting, definitely. Probably, maybe, new elephants. We've checked that northern edge there. Unfortunately, no sign of leopard or cheetah. Ellies are moving their way through this little river system to the right here. They're about over there and they're coming across through to the pan, which is over there. And then the buffalo are also in that area. So we're going to loop around. Such a beautiful morning. It's always a good idea to do a loop around a herd of buffalo and have a look for lion tracks because you never know if they've been harassed during the night.
So Kathy, who's in Tennessee, is wondering, apart from cheetah and ostrich, what animals are we going to see on cheetah plains that we don't normally see on Arethusa and Juma? I think the black-backed jackal, and we have seen them occasionally on both Arethusa and Juma, but we're more likely to see them more often here. And there is always a possibility of a sable antelope coming from Kruger to have a drink, especially as we head into the much drier time of the year. I think those are probably the two outside of the cheetah and ostrich that we might see with a little bit more frequency down here on cheetah plains. And that doesn't mean that they're never going to be seen on Jumo Arethusa, it just means it's more likely that we will see them down here on the more open areas. There's that herd of buffalo we saw from a distance a bit earlier. It's starting to slowly get mobile as it warms up. Oh, big herds of buffalo like to drink generally twice a day, once in the morning and once just in the evening. Oh, she's got a collar. So she, being very close to the edge of Kruger here, we do see quite a few collared animals and I'm pretty sure that buffalo is part of the TB research, bovine tuberculosis research. And we have seen a few with collars. And that lovely morning light on them. Probably about 200. I'm really hoping we see one of the monster herds come out of Kruger. Stanley White. Oh, wrong radio. Standing by. Copy, thanks James, I'm on CP. Look at that. So it's quite a warm morning, so they might get moving a little bit earlier than they would. And in winter, we often find them corralled close together till quite late in the morning, till the sun has warmed their bones. Just waiting for those elephants to pop through as well. They're no, not sure yet. There's a, a lazy, lazy buffalo, uh, a non-morning buffalo. Who would you say that buffalo is like? Who in our camp is a, is a bit slow in the morning, Brian? <laughs> uh, maybe Dave. Dave, that's Dave the buffalo there. He's still snoozing. But Brian's wondering what is the difference between a buffalo and a bison? Now, the American bison is also called the American buffalo. Our Cape buffalo are a bit smaller. They obviously don't have that big shaggy coat because they don't never have to deal with really cold winters and snow like the American buffalo. They are from the same family, but they are obviously different species. They're related to cows, both of them, and also are ruminants. But buffalo, or the Cape buffalo occur in Africa and the bison occur in North America. Uh, 
Tony Oldboy Fish is wondering about my college buffalo as a part of our reserves research. Tony, no, that'll be part of the Kruger National Park, National Parks research. So they move, the buffalo move to and from the National Park into the Sabi Sands. That buffalo will be part of National Parks research. And you can see the big mobile fertilizing machine is on the move. So a really important species in terms of fertilizing the grasses and also those hooves tilling the soil. So these buffalo are going to move between grazing and water holes and they can do quite a bit of distance, especially if they get chased by lions. But just judging from this lot's general behaviour, they've had a lion-free evening. So while we wait and watch these buffalo get moving, let's jump back on board with Sam, who's got some ellies. From the buffalo to the ellies, have a look at these, this family over here that's been playing. It's been so much fun just watching them. Myself and Dave heard them from a little bit, a little bit f further down the road, and we came straight to them. And they've just been playing on the road here, and there's a small little, small little one in the distance there. And these two are starting to have a little, well, it looks like they're just having some fun and playing. Oh, sweet, look at that little one. There he goes. <laughs> Why'd you get down, little, little guy? Ooh, so these guys are having a little tussle. Oh, no, sweet. <laughs> oh, I love little Ellie's. Look at them playing, yeah. Wow, this is cool. They look like such mates. Remember your, when you were a youngster and you had that one friend that you always just chilled with? That looks like these two over here look like best of mates. One is trying to jump on the other one's back. <laughs> Steve's asking if Elephants sometimes eat the acacia tree. Yes, they most certainly do eat the acacia tree. They eat pretty much anything out here. They actually love the flaky, the flaky acacia, flaky thorn acacia. It's, um, you never see it get as big as what we saw the one. Well, we see it, it gets a bit bigger than the one that we just saw now. But they love the flaky thorn acacia, so they do eat that. And it, it doesn't injure them um, as badly as you would think. The, that acacia thorn. Their, their trunks are very, very robust and resilient to any sort of thorn that they come across. They've developed a relationship between the acacia and the elephant over many, 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 many years, and both have become tried to become more resilient than the other. The elephant will, will find a way to get that food that it needs. Did you know that an elephant will feed for over 22 hours a day. I just think that's, that's quite an unreal stat. But look how comfortable they're looking as they throw their trunks out into the tree, wrap their trunk around the branch and pull it off. Oh, they're so strong. The youngsters are just in the background there. You can see they don't stray too far away from mother. 
Wat lig? <laughs> so iets. Ja, man. Yeah, how funny though. Sometimes they will stand on their trunks because they're just... <laughs> Funny. Have a look. Have a look at this one over here, Dave. The youngster is just sitting here, playing with his ears. Imagine if you were born with such big ears and a really big nose, it's just hanging from your face. <laughs> you just step on your nose all the time. Well, it's not a nose; it's a trunk, but. It's almost like a very long nose. Sometimes you'll see the elephants lift up their trunks and they look like they're just smelling. Often when, they, when the vehicles get a little bit close and they feel uncomfortable, you'll see their trunks go up in the air and they just smell. They try to figure out what you are. I'm going to see if I can get a little closer. They look very, very relaxed at the moment. So actually, I'm going to go probably just about 10 meters just so we can see the one feeding behind the termite mound there. Ellies are definitely, well, they're just, I mean, everything's exciting to watch out in the bush, but Ellies are just little tiny elephants. Did you see how funny those little two were? get that sort of a termite mount. I've had a young Ellie right next to it now. So termite mounds can be home to very well, significant plants such as the ivory trees, the brown and the red ivory. A very fertile ground around the termite mounds because of all the little termites that bring in the seeds from around around the area and that's where they germinate and they grow in the fertile grounds of the termite mound so wow i mean everything has its big influence out here but a but a termite really really manages to disperse a number of seeds around the bush and it plays such a critical role in terms of the diversity of birds in the bush vault and well, diversity of plants, sorry. And with the diversity of plants come the diversity of birds. So termites play a crucial role. Can I have a look at this guy? He puts it into his mouth, wraps his trunk around there. So elephants can get up to seven tons. Can you imagine that? Seven tons. Oh, if they had to sit on my car, they would basically crush it, the front. Not crush it, but they would leave quite a significant dent. A big bull. Have a look at those ears, though. Now we can quite clearly see how big those ears and that trunk is on that Ellie. Those ears will flap in the hot sun when it's very, very hot and that will help regulate the body temperature of the elephant. What a fantastic sighting, everyone. That was great. So you'll notice I'm going to start trying to use other words other than wow because I keep saying it. <laughs> but I think it all, it all started when I saw, I think it was Karula. Karula has the, the sign, the sign of wow on her forehead. And ever since I saw that, I was just like, wow. <laughs> With that, let's just go and see how Brent's doing. We're going to see if we can locate on some male lines. Well, that lovely buffalo sighting. And now I've just heard of a very, very rare bird sighting, which we're going to try to get to. And I'm, I'm actually not pretty sure. I'm 100% sure it's going to be a new bird species for a lot of people. But we've just left, we're going to loop around, 
check along those big open plains on the south first, look for Gnormnus Gnormen, and then make our way towards that bird. Oh, Ellie's doing some rearranging of roads. so close to the Kruger boundary, you never know what's going to come in. Hi Kim! Uh, Kim is Sinead's sister. Sinead is an ex-Safari live viewer who is now a safari guide right here in the Sabi Sands. So, Kim is wondering... Oh. So. Sorry Kim. Sorry Shoni, what was that on Clarendon? Okay, copy, thanks. And uh, Kim was wondering, do buffalo have a specific territory or do they just roam? Well, Kim, they have a home range, so a herd will move in a, in a sort of specific area. They don't, and it's a very big area and it also depends year to year, depending on rainfall and, and water and lots of things like that. Whether uh, that buffalo herd's home range will change or not. So we're about to come out into the, the big open area. And let's see what's here. So we've been seeing the ostriches quite a lot, which is always fun. I have been looking to try to show you guys a nice clear ostrich track. And now, speaking of ostriches, there they are. Get a little bit closer. Oh, it looks like there's a male f battle going on. Let's get a bit closer. They're still quite far away. Let's just put ourselves out in the open here. So you can see. That. A female ostrich and two males. Now the males, when they start getting into their breathing plumage, their legs and faces, or their legs and their beaks get bright red. And you can start seeing that red starting to show. Not quite yet on that one. There we go, you can see the red shin there, a little bit more prominent. We're going to keep watching these ostriches to see what happens. But while we do that, let's jump back to Sam, who's got something interesting to show you. What on earth are you putting in your mouth? <laughs> what? What is that? Dave, do you have any idea what that is? No, I don't. I thought for a second that it might be an ostrich egg, but it's most definitely not an ostrich egg. <laughs> what are you doing? What is that? Ooh, a bulb. Uh, something, from, something from under the ground. Ooh, he's trying to squash it. Interest. This is fascinating. Oh wow. Oh, look at this. Now they all want to get in on the action. 
That's, that was so interesting. I wonder what that was. Maybe it was something under the ground, like a tube, a tube like a root tuber thing. And that, that will bring a lot of moisture, a lot of nutrients in that. So look, as soon as he managed to break it open, all the other ones were like, I think I should have some of that as well. Look at that beautiful light that is, that is on them at the moment. Incredible. So we were on the way to go and see if we can go find lions, and then we just got stuck in the middle of this breeding herd. And you know what, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. As these Ellies have just provided Brian, I mean, not Brian, Brian's on the camera. Brent is with ostrich. I still haven't seen an ostrich since I've been here. That is super exciting. Let's go and see what Brent's up to with the ostrich. We're still watching those ostriches. And of course, our good buddy Gnormless is out on his patch of land as well. Here you go, the two ostriches behind Gnormless, Gnorman the Gnu. And some starlings in the foreground in the tree there. Some, what are they? Birchels. Yep, Birchel starlings. You can see that iridescence shining in the early morning light. Noisy, noisy. Let me just move a little bit so we can get a better view of these ostriches again. I was hoping they might move towards us. No such luck just yet. Oh, very funny creatures, ostriches. So they're mostly farmed for their very healthy meat, very low in, in fat. But the ostriches were originally farmed for two very important things in Victorian days. Now, the most important thing was for ladies' hats. So the big feather contraptions on top of ladies' hats when they went to a fancy dress or out to dinner. And the other thing that they were farmed with was for feather dusters. Donna says, please can I find an ostrich feather for you? I will definitely try. I will keep a look. And if I do spot one in our missions around. Now one of the biggest threats to an ostrich, strange enough, is a cheetah. And I've seen quite a few ostriches caught by cheetah over the year. Morning, morning. How are you guys? Shopping for. Morning. Wow. Um. Wow. I don't know if uh, we might be able to get this. Uh, Right, I'm going to pop it on the dash. It is tiny, tiny, tiny though. Oh, just on my finger. Now this is a little inchworm. It's a little caterpillar. But it looks like it's been attacked by a parasitic um, either fly or, or um, wasp. And I don't know if you can see, it's got two eggs laid on its body already. So those are going to hatch and those larvae are going to go inside this little guy and eat him from the inside. Wow, 
not in that. And I just noticed them crawling along the dash, but you can see those egg. Can you see them? I can't really see the monitor. Yeah. There we go, yeah. You can see them. There's two eggs that have been laid on him already. Well, the ostriches are running. Chasing each other about. So Monkey Man says he can't wait to see the male ostrich display. Uh, me too. It's going to be a fascinating thing. The females also do display. And one of the really cool things to watch an ostrich do, strangely enough, is to dust bath. As Ostrich Jaguar Gnormless looks like he might have spotted something. He's staring very intently to the west. Let's get my binoculars out. Try to see what Gnormless might have seen. Oh no, now his head's down. Maybe it was a false alarm. But still worth having a look across the plains. Oops, pushing buttons. Go back to sleep, GoPro. On a big open area like this, it's always worth having a look with binoculars. So while you guys look at Gnorman, I'm just going to quickly scan all the bushes. Nope. Nothing but the Gnormless this morning. And of course those three ostriches. One of the landing, they're landing. I don't know if you heard that very faint doot, boop, overhead. Um, it was the rare bird we were looking for, but now there's some more have landed here. It landed quite far. Let me just go forward a bit. Tiny little ground bird. And where did they land? They landed to the left. There, I think I got them. Let's go to the left a bit. Not, wait a minute, not those there. And this is the. Keep going past the lap wings. Let's go down. I thought I saw one around there. It's a Temex Corsa. Oh, is that, there they are. that a Temex Corsa that is definitely a new bird for almost everyone I'm sure unfortunately we can't get too much closer to it it'll sort of fly away there were some more on the other open area so hopefully they'll be a bit closer to the road road but I'll show you what they look like properly quickly They're a bit far away but Temex Corsa a short plains a bird I just heard them come over. Boop, boop. Look at that. So, related to lapwings, we have seen one other Corsa, which is more nocturnal than this one, and that is the bronze wing Corsa we've seen at night. We will try and get a better view, but a very rare bird in the Sabi Sands, not something we see too often. Here we go, the Temex Corsa. Very pretty, pretty bird. And it's the smallest of the African Corsas. Here we 
here's a photograph. Very, very cool. Hopefully that's a new bird for lots of you. I don't think, I definitely haven't ever seen one since I've been at Safari Live. And it's a bird number 92 for Monkey Man, so well done. But I'm gonna go check where there was some more earlier. It might be a bit closer to the road. So it's so funny, we're actually on our way to that area. Micah, it's 107 birds for Micah. But uh, I can't remember the last time I saw a Temex for Corsa. Let's see if we can catch up with those ostriches as well. Pincy Winer's cat is wondering how do we spell the name. It's Temex Corsa, T-E-M-M-I-N-C-K, apostrophe S. There's ostriches go as well. Uh, Maggie's wondering what sounds do ostrich make? They actually make a lion like roar and they also boom. They can do, let me just find that right. Stuff. So I can try to find you the ostrich's call. They went off into the thickets there. Hopefully they will come out into the open again. I'm just trying to find it quickly. Oh dear, I can't seem to find ostrich. Oh, let's go see what we can see next to the pan. I'll do it there while I'm not driving. And I'll play you the sounds of an ostrich the boom of an ostrich. Siberia is wondering how often do ostriches drink water or do they get enough moisture from what they eat? Well, like most animals, if there is water available, they will drink regularly. But if there isn't, ostriches are not too dependent on water. So remember, their preferred habitat is much drier than this normally, and they live right in the Kalahari and Namib deserts. So they're not dependent on water, and they generally will get what moisture they need, either from their food or from dew in the early mornings. This is where some more Temex courses were called in, so let's just check carefully, see if they're close to the road. I can't see any Temex courses, but I can see some Ellie's. in Ontario is wondering how many eggs can an ostrich lay? Quite a lot. I think uh, they can lay over 20. 
and the nest is guarded by both the male and female. Hello Ellie's. Bob is wondering if we can go off-road on cheetah planes. We can, but there's no need to off-road when, or you never off-road when it's not 100% necessary. And also on those sensitive soils in the open areas, we tend not to off-road. We'll try off-road around the edges of them. Hello, Ailey's. Nice herd coming through. I think it's the same herd Brian I saw earlier coming through from the Kruger. So peaceful. Hey little guy, that's a nice little knob thorn you've got there. Um, nice young male. Oh. I had a few different big females in this group as well. There's that young male in front of us eating the grass. You can see the front feet there. Are they a bit differently shaped? So they've got a really distinct sort of pedestal, that big wide foot to carry those massive front forequarters of an elephant. Hello, yes. You're very scary, mister. Just shaking his head at us, just to let us know that he's big and strong and he's here. So the majority of the herd looked fine, but there was a little bit of unease that I could pick up on. I'm not sure why. So we're not going to go crashing off-road after them. We'll just let them slowly move on past. I'm still trying to find the booming ostrich. I can't believe it. The ostrich call, that is. And it seems to be a mystery but there's no ostrich in the bird act, which can't be possible. It's the biggest bird we have. Let's just try and move forward a little bit, see if we still get a view of these ellies. They are moving quite quickly and spreading through the bush. One or two gray bottoms. One last Look at the disappearing bottom. So, speaking of Ellie's, Red is wondering, is Mr. Hole in the Air still around? Um, and he is, I actually saw him a couple of days ago, but uh, he's not in full must anymore and he's not spending so much time on quarantine. And Red's also been keeping an 
up to date, pretty new at this on by watching the little Safari Live stories we pop out every now and then. So, Miss Lynn's wondering how thick does an elephant's hide get? And it can be very thick. It's probably about two or three inches thick. So, very, very, very thick and very, very strong. And so, it's very difficult for thorns or branches to actually go through it. And I've just realized I might have another way to find you the ostrich's core on my West African birds. Here we go. I do have it after all. You hear that? So quite often people get confused with ostrich calls because it sounds a little bit like a lion at a distance, but it's not. It's the booming of the ostrich. So Teresa's saying she's noticed that elephants turn their heads and scratch their ears when they see the vehicle. Uh, Teresa, I don't think it's because they see the vehicle. I, they do it quite often and I think it's just because they got an itchy ear. Yeah. So alas, no cheetah on the plains of Cheetah this morning. But we will keep checking. Uh, maybe we will find some tracks of Mr. Q, quarantine male leopard. Never know what could be out here. So we see lots of different leopards out here, and Cheryl is in California would like to know how do we tell them apart. Well, a leopard's spots are as individual as your fingerprints. But the best and most reliable way is that they have a line of spots just above their last line of whiskers. And uh, those are very unique, and that is their spot pattern. So, for example, um, Karula is a 3-4. Three, 3 on the right, 4 on the left. A quarantine I can't remember what quarantines is offhand, but uh, Tingana is a 4-3, is a so you count that last line of spots above, a lip, uh, sorry, a, the line of spots above the last line of whiskers is the most reliable way to identify the different leopards. If you spend a lot of time with them like we do, quite often you can also just pick up on body shape and size depending on what, where you are and what territory they're in. Marianne in Texas is saying, if we find a new leopard, what would we consider a safe distance to keep? Marianne, it completely depends on, on, on the, that individual at that particular moment in time. Quite often, even if we see a new leopard, it could be just as relaxed as all the leopards we know because uh, we are in the Sabi Sands and the leopards here are very habituated to the vehicles. But we did spend some time with an unrelaxed male recently. And again, you have to just judge it on each individual occurrence. Sometimes 50 meters is, is too close, sometimes 20 meters is too close. It just depends on that specific time and you need to watch the animal's body behavior and then react accordingly.
but Corey's wondering if we viewed any hybrid animals in the wild. Um, I have seen a few hybrid bird species, Corey, but no hybrid mammal species. It's very, very uncommon for that to happen without human beings putting their naughty little fingers in there. But, um, but birds hybridize quite commonly and so do insects. So more common in the avian and insect worlds than in, in mammals. So we're going to do the last swing by the cheetah pan. Uh, no, not cheetah pan, pan. Past three in a row pan. And see if anything might have moved in there while we've been down in the south and east. I wonder where Mr. Q has disappeared to. Cheetah Plains has definitely produced some really great birds. I mean, Temex Corsa. And what else was there? Temex Corsa, what else have we seen that's new down here? I think Bronzewing Corsa was a, a, a new one for a lot of people as well. I'm trying to think. Ah, yes, the night jar. The, the square tailed night jar was a new one. So some interesting birds and it's so nice to have a slightly different uh, area so you get a variation like it's unlikely to find those courses or especially the Temex Corsa on Juma because there's not enough big open grassland and that's what they prefer. So x Ranger is wondering about the nearly impossible tree quiz from a couple of days ago. Um, I don't think it was yesterday, I think the day before. And he was wondering if there was an answer to it. And there was, it is that, um, there's the answer right next to us. Well, there's the tree itself. It is a, a low, uh, well, a, a bush fault or low fault false thorn. Albizia harvii. And there is another one. So that was the nearly impossible tree quiz from a few drives ago. Oh, sorry. Just listening to the game drive radio for a second. Ah, unfortunately, it seems like in Canyon, the female leopard has been found, but to the north of us. dash past the pan Zzz. and then I think we're going to start moving back towards the west there we got some hammer corpse the hammerhead bird that's a little heron species and there we go making that noise uh, one of their favorite foods is frogs. They're often hunting around for tadpoles, frogs, and other aquatic creatures to feed on. A bit of morning preening. Hello. Now, it's very important for birds to do this preening. Those feathers are out of place, it might affect their flight. There's definitely been explosions of flies again today. I think this is the most I've seen in a long time. Hmm, 
Well, that's what the Hemacorp thinks of us, so well, we're going to continue on. <laughs> hey, Reed. Uh, we're going to go to Sam, who, who has been slightly indisposed for the last while and uh, has taken, according to final control, five years to change a tyre. We've just changed the tyre. So from that elephant sighting that we had here, started running or driving down Gowrie Main, and the next thing Dave was like, I feel like something's wrong. We looked to the side of the car, the wheel was on the side. James wasn't so far away, he's here in the Mahindra in front of us. So he came to our rescue. I don't know where he's gone now, but he was helping us out. Ooh, we are still in low range. Now I hope that you guys have been having a fascinating time with Brent. Hope that you with ostrich all the many different things. There we go. On the road again. On the road again. I'm still in low range. How's it going there, James? You're yeah, fine enough. How are you, Sam? <laughs> I'm now on the road again. Good. As you were. <laughs> Hello everybody, my name. So we had fun. You know, these, this is old Wendy that we have here. And it's always an interesting experience changing the tire of a car. <laughs> these cars, these, these tires, these cars are not very small, so it takes a little bit of strength to put the tire up on there. But uh, it was fun, good fun. Hopefully now we're going to see if we can come across some male lions. To be honest, I really enjoy actually changing a tire. There's something about it that's it's actually quite fun. I mean, it can be exceptionally dangerous. The high, the high lift jack can, can, click, can click out and it can get really badly injured. This is the main reason why I called Mr. Mr. Henry to help me out. Just because I'm not going to act like I'm some sort of superhero and then get myself injured. Experience it once and then I can do it on my own. But so far we've had an amazing sighting of the sun. We've seen some elephants. We've seen, talked about a flaky thorn acacia. And it's Earth Day tomorrow. I mean, it's pretty much Earth Day every single day. I mean, in terms of our appreciation for the Earth shouldn't just be on one day. But it is important to, to take one day in which we can uh, maybe do a whole bunch of extra things that we wouldn't do on a normal day of appreciating the Earth. Because in every single morning when I look at the sunrise, I'm very grateful. But I'm so excited to see what you guys all do. asking what is it that I would like to plant well to be honest I have to be well the vegetables not plants so I have to be quite careful in what I'm doing here because you can imagine there's a whole bunch of other animals that would like to eat my vegetables other than humans so we've got baboons we've got monkeys so I have to be careful and so what I've decided is as the best option is a peppers um, chilies to so grow chilies uh, most animals don't Chilies, so I grow some chilies and then I can make some nice saucy Mexican and Indian foods. So we're doing one last gander along the southern boundary for Cheetah onto the Termite Mound where we first spotted them. But as you can see, the termite mound is devoid of cheetah. So we will be continuing on. Oh, 
I feel like doing some birding now that we've got this wonderful new camera that can go doo -doo, I think is the best way to describe it, the punch zoom. Let's have a look for some birds. Sally's saying we haven't seen a secretary bird for a long time. Are there any that live in Southern, oh, not in Southern California, in Southern Cheetah Plains? Uh, Sally is from Southern California. Uh, not that I've seen, but they do move uh, between these big open areas and they can have a large home range. So it is possible we might see one, but we haven't seen one yet. So this is also the area where Tundi's unnamed female cub lives. So we always got a chance at seeing her. I think we're just going to call her Angus Steve for now means I don't know because she doesn't have a name yet. So she isn't the most relaxed around vehicles. So we'll just hopefully find her. So as I mentioned yesterday uh, about Kunuma, my friend who works to the west of us, saw him recently near the Londolosi boundary and he was looking very well. So, and of course we caught up with quarantine on Sunday, I think it was. So both birds doing well. Of course, when you decide to look for birds, there's not one in sight, but when you're looking for animals, there are birds everywhere. We continue to search the southern extremities of the cheetah plains. Sam has got a great part to show you. It's a terrapin, everyone. Look at him go. He's going to go find some water. I can tell you what, he's got quite a far distance to go before he can find some water. Have a look at him. He's, you don't often get to see a terrapin out of water, so you can see him quite clearly now. His head coming out and his, his feet. I often find their tracks in the morning and I just think, cheapers, I would love to watch a terrapin out of water. And here we are sitting with a terrapin out of water. So the question is, why do you think he is out of water? Why are you out of the water, Mr. Terrapin? I think that he might be out of the water because he's looking for new grounds where maybe that he could spread his own seed, meet some females. I think he's been tired of the last little watering hole he was at. Orson's asking, what is the difference between a terrapin and a turtle? Well, a terrapin we, we don't find in the ocean, but a turtle we find in the ocean. And you'll find that turtles are a, a lot bigger than the terrapins. But they, of course, are all extended from the similar families. But you'll see with this terrapin, it's called the serrated hinged terrapin. So if we, had, if we were able to get a closer look We'll be able to see the defining features that show us that it's a serrated hinge terrapin. But turtles are incredible. I don't know if any of you guys have ever swum in the ocean with a turtle. What a magnificent feeling that is. I did that when I was a kid with my dad. I was swimming in the oceans close to Mauritius and we swam with turtles. I was very, very privileged to have had that experience. Wow, so there goes the terrapin. Hopefully he's going to find some water. I think you know, he's going towards the Mawati drainage here. So he might think that there's water there, but there's no water there. In fact, there's actually 
just sand, as you can see. But this is one of my favorite places to drive in the reserve. Because we're right by the drainage line. We've got some beautiful leadwood trees, some Tumburti trees. And jackalberry trees. So the lions are moving in all sorts of directions up into up this drainage. So we're going to go down into the Mawati and we're going to drive through this, the river bank to see if we can get to a point where we can then find tracks. Because apparently they're moving all through that block and that block is very, very thick. Very, very, very thick. So what we'll do is we'll see if we can find some tracks of the male lions. And I haven't seen a male lion yet, so when I see one, you're going to see I'm going to be very happy. I'm going to be very happy when I find a male lion. I've only seen the Inkuhumas since I've been here. See, so you can see that over there there were tracks. Someone has driven up there to see if they can find them. So I'm going to carry on through the drainage to see what I can find. Just while we drive through here, just going back to that question on what vegetables I'm going to grow. I'm thinking of growing peppers, chilies, to make with my hot meals. What are you thinking of putting in your vegetable garden in a few days' time or tomorrow? Are you going to start a veggie garden? And do you already have a compost heap going at your house where you put all your organic waste that then can go into your garden and create feedback loops? taking waste and putting it back into the soil. Look, I feel like I'm in a prehistoric time when I drive through here. Don't you get that feeling, Dave? It's amazing. You often find some black-headed oriole that they threw here. Can just imagine a male lion just walking through the block here, coming down into this drainage and surprising us all with its magnificent beauty. What is your favorite animal? What would you like to see out here this morning other than a male lion? We've still got a couple, probably about an hour or so, hour and a half left of drive. Other than a male lion, what would you all like to see this morning? And we'll do our very best. I know everyone from two days ago wanted to see a zebra, and I haven't seen a zebra in over two days. So I'm also keep an eye out for the dazzling zebras. Seems like young Samuel has found some gremlins. So hopefully he manages to sort those out. Brian and I are still checking now slightly more to the west. Just having a look if we can find any sign of that female leopard. But no tracks. This is the area we've had her tracks in before. But she does tend to reside further to the south in Mala Mala. So I think we're going to start making our way back towards the west. We've definitely scoured the whole of Chief Plants this morning and were treated with a fantastic ostrich sighting, beautiful big herd of buffalo, some ellies, and I think my highlight for the day, Temex Corsa.
So Tyler's wondering what are some of the most rare animals we've seen on the live safaris. So on the live safaris, any tracks there, Brian? No? Sad face. Uh, uh, probably serval, honey badger. What else can you think of, Brian? So in themselves, they're not that rare. They're quite well spread, widespread and common. They just live in very low densities, so you don't see them very often. But in my travels around Africa, I've seen some incredibly rare animals. I've seen a rare race of a red colobus monkeys that we found a population that wasn't even supposed to exist in Tanzania. And Nyasa wildebeest, a, a rare type of wildebeest that occurs in southern Tanzania and northern Mozambique. He's got a white stripe across his nose, a white chevron. Gorillas, the western lowland gorillas, uh, chimpanzees. Trying to think what else? Lots of things. I've been very lucky in my travels and, and the places I've been able to live and work over the last 10 or so years. got one more water hole to check. It's called the Chi, I think it's called the Lodge Pan. It's right in front of Cheat Plans Lodge. And I don't think we, it's the only water hole we haven't checked yet on this fine, beautiful late summer's morning. Not a cloud in the sky. Jim's wondering if we get the black-footed cat in the Sabi Sands. We do not. They're an arid species. They prefer much drier areas. So the closest black-footed cats to here are probably a couple of hundred kilometers away towards the Botswana border. And there you have a black-footed cat. Smaller than the African wild cat, but nonetheless less beautiful. Very pretty little feline. out into that little open area that's close to the cheetah pans a lodge and let's see if there's anything at the water hole look like anyone's checked this road this morning so who knows we might find a leopard track so we're just going to check this nice open area near the lodge pan and uh, if we've got nothing here Uh, there's some impala right down in the distance. So while we have a quick listen, see if there are any sounds that might lead us to something fascinating, let's go back to Sam, who's with a dugger boy. Copy that. A buffalo creeps through the thickets here on Mamba Road, which is where the thick, thick bushes, this is all monkey orange around here, so trying to drive through here is not easy at all. 
But why are we just looking at, at the buffaloes? Because this is exactly the area where the lions were walking through not a couple of minutes ago. So we're busy on the lookout for the lions. They've gone into this thicket. And we're going to do our best to see if we can find them. But above us, right over here, is a beautiful old knobthorn tree. And I just thought I would just show it to you. You can see just beneath it here, it's been ring boxed, um, which means that the elephants have got to the cambium layer, which is just below the bark. And the cambium layer allows them to get some nutrients and some water on very hot days. So this knobthorn has died as a consequence of elephants doing such a thing. But we've got another nice sighting of that buffalo just over here. So there's the buff. Let's carry on and see if we can find the lions. And now we know where this buffalo is. So if we see the lions heading in a westy direction, we know to come back down and see if they are interested in eating something like a buffalo this morning. But I heard that we have some South American friends here from, I think it was, where was it? Where? Argentina. Argentina. Come estas? Come estas? Si. <laughs> yeah, I can't speak much Spanish. I can, I can say hermano, which means, I think it means brother. I used to study last year with a good Spanish friend and I used to shout from the other side of the classroom. I used to go, hermano. <laughs> but I was living in Brazil for some time when I was there in South America. I can speak a little bit of Portuguese. Ta bom, muito bom. Okay, so the lions I just heard that they are on the other side of this road. So we had Batalia that's next to us, and then we have Central, and that's where they are at the moment. So they've bypassed this buffalo and gone into another area. So I'm going to try and pick up my speed a little bit, see if we can find them. Apparently they're lying down as the sun begins to warm the country. This is the exact time the lions like to lie down underneath a piece of shade. But it is very thick here. I'm so glad you guys are sending through your pictures of what you're going to plant. I think that's so awesome. Seriously, I've, my passion is gardening and just getting my hands in the soil. Uh, my, my twin brother and I actually, well, my twin was the main founder of the farm. We built an organic farm where we studied in Stellenbosch. You can actually have a look at the farm that we built on YouTube. You can type in Sustainable Brothers Organic Farm. And then you'll see a whole bunch of videos and links to little farming projects that my brother and I have done in Cape Town, in some of the rural communities outside Cape Town, in Ceres and in Langer. And our mission statement through Sustainable Brothers and Sisters is to create a, almost like a social organization where we can get the collective in. As, as you know, South Africa is going through quite a difficult time. So how do we get the youth connected? And we believe that through doing shared experiences together, we'll develop commonalities that will allow us to go into the future together and have a relationship. And planting and getting your hands in the soil is one way of doing that. And that's one of our strongest, well, the one thing that we've done in our past that is, I'm very, very proud of. And I just enjoy it very much. Getting my hands dirty. Does anyone know what hummus means? Hummus. It's, it's the same in humility, humus, humility. It means soil. To be humble, soil. To have humility it comes from the earth. My teacher from Schumacher College told me that. His name was Satish Kumar. Sam, be humble like the soil, he used to say to me. So I'm very, very glad you guys are all doing some gardening. That's, that gets me very, very excited. 
But do you know what would get me even more excited? Is if I could show you a male lion. And I, Debbie, I know it's your birthday and that you wanted to see a leopard. But it's going to be very hard to, to view leopard on the property at the moment, especially when we've got male lions. And I heard that's not just one of them, it's a couple of them. So, can a male lion substitute? They are the Birmingham males, which I haven't viewed yet. So I'm very excited to view the Birmingham males the first time. Just while we're driving there, on the subject of, of farming, my brother's actually developed a business. It's called Plant the Seed. My twin brother, Plant the Seed, which is about... Well, it's not only just planting vegetable gardens in, in communities and in people's homes um, and just for for the sake of gardening. It's not about that business. The business is not around just gardening, but it's also trying to change education or design education that isn't so linear. And it tries to take kids, goes into schools and teaches kids other sort of skills that help them develop into the future that is beginning to change not change in a bad way but just become leaders and that's my brother's business so i'm very proud of my twin brother thomas okay so we are on central road this is apparently where the male lines were i've got to look out for vehicle tracks because apparently that is where they will lead us to the male lines so Dave, can you have a look on the left just in case you might see vehicle tracks heading off in a southerly direction? There we go. Here comes the vehicle run. Let us now. Give them some room. Thank you very much, Mom. All right, let's go see these Birminghams. It's been so cool getting to know everyone around here. Oh, Austin hasn't seen the lines either. All right, so let, let's. Let's do that. Let's go in together and have a shared experience of these beautiful Birmingham, Birmingham males. So he said he left something on the road. Once again, we are in very thick bush, so I have to be quite aware of where everything is. It wasn't here. Not here. I'm actually getting very excited right now. I haven't seen these males. But I have to concentrate during my excitement. Dave, have you seen any vehicle tracks going that side? Just please let me know. Myself and Dave have seen so much over the past few days. It's the first time we've seen, we've seen leopard, we've seen wild dogs. Now we're gonna go see some male lions. Mm. Let's link to Brent while we search for these lions. Hopefully when you come back, we'll be with them.
So while Sam looks for the lions, we're back on Juma, and I'm just gonna do a, a scout along the southern boundary. Fingers crossed that while we've been on Cheetah Plains, the Queen has decided to join us. So the last report I heard of her, she was seen about 150 meters beyond that bend in the river. But that was two days ago, and we haven't had any tracks crossing in. So hopefully, she might have decided to grace us this morning. Because you never really find Karula. Karula graces you with her presence. Morning, morning. Hi, nice to see you. Lucky like you. Hi. Good, good. Anything happening in the west? <laughs> okay. Hi, uh, nice to come with Nyari across to your side on Kalko. That's it? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to keep you going. Cool. Enjoy, what good luck. Uh, I think we're coming in, but on the Nkoro Tortured Fiber. Nkoro Tortured Fiber? Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Cool. Enjoy. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Here we go. Quick morning meeting, a catch up with Peter from Inkoro. So not much happening. I was thinking toying with going off to the west, but not, nothing happening. So I think we'll focus on wishing Karula across the boundary, probably more so than tracking her. Ah, uh, left tracks and tortured, unfortunate. So, Catherine uh, said she never heard the answer for the which national park has the highest densities of leopards in Africa. Now, uh, Catherine, it was the South Luangwa National Park in Zambia. That was the answer. We asked that question a few days ago. I think Brian and I are going to go in search of some birds. I think we need to add another new bird to everyone's bird list this morning. So we will be keeping a very sharp eye up in the air and in the trees. So, still on the subject of birds, Siberia is wondering, do we get any ravens here? We do, it is possible to see, uh, or ravens or crows. I have seen a pied crow in the Sabi sands before. But I haven't seen the only real raven we get here, which is just bigger than the crow, not a massive bill, is the white-necked raven. But I have never seen them in this part of South Africa. Quick look here. Oh, how, how fortunate. I was on sea on the bird. Just give it a quick dust. Lots of dust about this morning. So there we go. So there we go. That's the pied crow, which we will sometimes get yet. And the white necked raven is one you might confuse it with, although it's much bigger bird and you see it that the white doesn't extend onto the belly so that massive massive bill now one of the biggest uh, problems we get here and there's the cape crow the other indigenous corvus member in this area is this here the house crow or the indian house crow now they have become a plague in certain cities in africa namely on the east coast um, maputo in mozambique dar es salaam and Mombasa. Now they've actually exterminated a lot of the indigenous bird species and there's a big push to try eradicate them. They've done incredibly large amounts of damage uh, to the indigenous birds there. So much so that the birds, uh, sort of like the, the robins and that, will only call early, early in the morning before the crows wake up and they will keep completely silent after that. Oh. That's interesting, baboon tracks coming in. 
I have been seeing a lot more baboon tracks around recently. Let me just see if we can show you. They're from yesterday, they've been driven over, but nevertheless. There we go, baboon tracks. And you can see that the foot and the thumb. So maybe we'll be lucky enough to see baboons again. I know you, we saw baboons with Jamie not too long ago. Brian's wondering when was the last time we had a view of some vultures. Brian, we see them most days, uh, but quite often they'll be very high in the sky, so very difficult to put on camera. But we do see vultures probably every day. The last time we had a good view of some vultures, now that's a different question, and probably about four or five days ago. While we continue to see what is out and about, let's jump on with Sam, who has found the Birmingham boys. Male lions, everyone. Oh man, they are fast asleep. This is so cool. Look at them. This is the first time I am meeting you, Mr. Birmingham. Birmingham's. Look at the morning light on his face. Oh, this is so cool. We found the lions. We found them. And they're just going to be resting up in the shade for most of the day now. They were walking through this block. I can imagine they've been walking their territory all night, set marking, showing, showing all the other lions out there that this is their space, this is my territory. And now they're coming down for a rest. So it's a much well-deserved rest for these young lions. It's incredible to meet them. I, I heard that they, they used to be the Matimbas here. Is that right? The Matimbas. So the Matimbas were just two lions, and they just they didn't even put up a fight when these big, big Birmingham boys came in. They left, and I, uh, they're actually now further south, uh, towards Londolozi, which is I find quite interesting because Londolozi is prime kind of land for a lion. So they left this land, and they've gone towards the river, which is fairly interesting. But apparently the Matimbas were really, really big boys, so they might be able to handle themselves out there. But these ones, like, have a look at these Birmingham boys. Look at, at their manes, golden in that sunlight. Hugely lucky to be sitting with you now. All four of them as well. It's not often you get to see the whole coalition together as a pack. But they will be flat for most of the day. And that's fine with me. I'll still smile. Mm. When was the last time you guys saw the Birmingham? So definitely wasn't since I just since I arrived two and a half weeks ago. So this is only my first sighting. They walked through the property one or two nights. Maybe you've seen them on the on the, on the Juma cam. It's, I never forget. I came and was watching Safari Live, and I was watching one of them eat. I think it was a kudu or a giraffe. And Jamie was with one of them, and apparently it was very very stinky. That sighting. Jamie was complaining about the smell. The smell was very, very harsh. And that's what they do. Yes, male lions are, to watch male lions at a sighting when they've killed something is, is, is another thing. You know, they, it doesn't matter what they're eating, they just eat. You know, some predators will, will take caution to, to the parts of the animal that they eat first like cheetah and leopard, for example, because they know that hyenas and, and vultures and all sorts will be 
looking to find some food from carcasses, they'll eat the most nutritional parts, like I think it's the liver and that sort of stuff. They won't open up the stomach because that sends out a dreadful smell and the bush can smell that from very far away. But when it comes to the lions, they'll open up that stomach and eat whatever they please in the time that they please. Safari Dean's asking how far away are they from that buffalo? That's a good question, Safari Dean. Um, so we drove, we drove on, I think it was Mumba Road. Mumba Road was just to the south of us and then we came past Batelier and now we are on Central. So we are about 100 meters south of Central, which means that we must be around 250 meters to, to 300 from that buffalo. So it's not that far away. I mean, if they get hungry and they, ooh, that was a nice little shake of that man in the beautiful morning sunlight. But if they do get hungry and they start heading in a southerly direction and they come across a lone male buffalo, anything can happen. And it's four of them, so that just makes them a lot more powerful than they would be if they were just on their own. And I'm so glad that the lions took me into this area as well. It's quite an interesting area. A huge diversity of trees here, from jackalberries to quarry bushes to acacias, sickle bush, some of the trees that I haven't seen since I've been here. While we sit here with these beautiful Birmingham lions, let's go and see what Brent's up to. Apparently, he's got some birds with him. Look at this, a beautiful little yellow-fronted canary. And the reason we're focusing here is I actually did see a bird that we've been searching for to put on camera, the green-winged patilia, that is possibly still in that bush somewhere. But they've just been bathing in the treehouse water hole. Now, let's have a look a little bit. There should be some little wax balls around there as well. Now, where is that patilia hiding? Hello, little wax bulls. Where's your friend, the patilia? Used to be called the Melba Finch. We're all having a nice bath when we arrived. Oh, there's some of them bathing again, it looks like. Okay, there we go. Toop. <laughs> There's some wax bills and a canary bathing. Oh, that looks like fun. <laughs> They've almost got the synchronized bathing down. Look at that. One, two, and one, two, three. No, off, done. And there we go. There's another little wax bill still bathing there and a yellow fronted canary also bathing. I was hoping that the other birds bathing might entice the patilia down for another bath. Something spooked them. I looked up. Uh, it was a starling that flew overhead. I think they got a fright thinking it might be a bird of prey. So the patilias might have just moved to the bush on the other side there. So we're going to just see if we can sneak a bit closer. It would be great to get you two new species for the bird lists today. And it's a wonderful thing about this camera, we've got that ability to zoom right in. Just the canaries. The others are all on the, the right of the road here. They might have dipped down into the little river system. Okay, that knob thorn there seems to have quite a few little birds in it. Let me have a look at the thorn. So what we can do, oh, what's that there? Is it, is it 
No, I don't think so. Okay, another canary. But we can try we can try a little bird watching trick and to mimic the alarm call of a bird, see if they pop out to have a look what we could be. Are they buying the trick, Brian? Not yet. Not yet. Let's try again. Here we go. A few of them popping out to have a look. Ooh, coming a bit closer as well. Let's do it one more time for good measure. a bit closer to have a look but it's i can only see the wax bills no patillas just yet oh what do we got there oh we're just in the wrong spot it should move out in the just in this bush here on the other side but it's a looks like a little tawny flanked prinia to have a look at us but unfortunately i don't see the bird we're in search of but i do hear some smaller birds up ahead again and we're on the hunt for the green winged patilia for those who haven't seen it before or know what it looks like it's a very beautiful bird brightly colored sounded like there were some more little birds around here. Uh, more wax bills and unfortunately but we will keep searching. So while we try find you a few new bird species for your bird list let's go to the complete opposite end of the spectrum. Those big beautiful Birmingham boys with Sam. From birds to lions, such diversity in our day as we sit here with, the, with these male lions with the sun just on top of them as they groom themselves. Well, just one of them's grooming himself. He's been up for the last three, four minutes just licking himself all over the body, cleaning himself. And, and as you know, lions have almost like sandpaper tongues. So if there's any parasites like ticks or anything like that, he is able to clean them off with that tongue. I wouldn't like that tongue to, I think it would pull all the skin off my, off my arm if he had to lick my arm. Look at that, you know, they're just such, it's been such a long time since I've been with a male lion and it's just great. Erlene's asking, where is the fifth male lion? Erlene, I'm really not sure where the fifth one is this morning. Um, just i just know that there's just four of them i didn't hear of the fifth one maybe the fifth one isn't so far away from here and might join the coalition and make the full pack but dave and i were just sitting here with them and it's just it's just amazing to be around animals like lions and as they you know that whole pack mentality and you know how they work together as a team as, as brothers on the hunt on, on on looking after territory on defending themselves it's just, you know, it's just such a, it's a different world when you start to perceive and empathize with something like a lion and how they have to live and what they have to do and understanding their purpose. You know? They know that they need to walk that territory every night, feed every day, groom themselves and sleep, of course, like we're seeing now. And that's generally the daytime activity. Generally in the daytime, we're going to find big big cats lying down and relaxing as they get ready for the night. Earl's asking, do lions dream and what do you think they dream about? 
Well, that's, a, that's a good question. I'll, I've never actually thought of that at all. Um, if I had to think about what, what this lion's hunting, well, sorry, what this lion's dreaming about, I'd say that he's, he's dreaming of hunting his favorite meal, something like a kudu, big male kudu. He's getting himself prepared for the night so that he can go and be in the best position. Ooh, quick link, we've got a baboon. Listen to that sound. There's a baboon fight going on. Wow! Let's try to see if we can get a sight of him. It's so funny, we were just talking about those tracks not even a few minutes ago. And then all of a sudden we just saw this baboon dash across the road being chased by another. Let's see if we can catch up with them. It seems like quite a nice big troop. When, when, those sounds incredible. I do love the noises that a baboon makes. Wow, wow. And the screaming. of them. Oh, it's the biggest primate we get here in the Sabi Sands. Let's listen for a second, see if we can hear where they are again. Hear anything, Brian? No. Well, let's check down towards Chelepan. Hoping to get a visual through one of these gaps. Sometimes the baboons, especially the baboons we see, are not very relaxed with around the vehicles. So we just need to keep our distance a little bit. Yeah, we might have to go around, I think, but we'll keep looking. I can't see them now. They were moving at high speed, chasing each other. They are incredibly interesting animals to watch. James Richard says, yay baboons, I'm so excited. So, unfortunately they were chasing each other in quite a thick area there, but those baboons fights can become very serious very quickly. So baboons have a, a lovely social structure, structure. You have dominant males, but there'll be a couple of them that sort of control the goings on of the troop. And they are big into discipline and they will beat and scold Young, young baboons and females, and regularly, so they can be quite spectacular to watch when they do that. I'm just going to head back up around. It'd be really nice if a troop of baboons decided to spend a bit more time here. They might, with this dry, dry weather we've been having, they might be struggling for food. So moving in bigger, bigger arcs away from the more prominent river systems. Just gonna listen one more time quickly, but I think they may be moving west, southwest. They have this wonderful little contact call that they use a lot between themselves, a sort of oom, 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 like a oom. one in the distance there. Mm -hmm. 
And we're gonna loop around this block again. Hopefully we will catch up with them. While we look for these baboons, let's uh, go back to Sam and the Birmingham boys. So you've been looking for baboons with Brent. That's exciting. So from male lions to baboons, what an exciting day it is today. Some birds that just flew above us. Looked like, sounded like. What do you think that sounded like, Dave? Not too sure Sounded like an ox picker. So when you hear that sound, the ox picker can tell you that there could be a herbivore close by, something like a buffalo, or even anything, like an impala. So it's always good to know those sounds because they might indicate to us something that might be here. But Dave and I were just having a little chat about what the sort of things they'd be dreaming about. and. I know it's unlikely, but, ooh, one's up, hello. Ooh, awesome. Look at that, wow. So I think what happened there, he realized he was in the sun and he was getting very hot. He was like, I don't need that heat anymore. And he went and found some good shade, but that was, she was, that was cool to look at that main. Oh, very lucky to see a standing flat cat. But we were taught, oh, hello. What's you, what are you dreaming about? Now, I reckon he's dreaming of a massage. He's getting the best massage of his life. But well, what we, myself and Dave were chatting about was maybe they're dreaming of the ocean. You know, they don't get to see the ocean very often, so they maybe when they, after they do all their work all day long, they, they lie down and go, hmm, what does that ocean look like? What are those waves like? To be honest, that's just me. <laughs> that's just what I dream about, so I'm just actually telling you about my dreams, not the dreams of these, of these lines, <laughs> with, one, with one foot in the air. Fast asleep. It's quite funny. Sometimes you'll see lions, they'll be so flat and tired and they'll just start weighing in their sleep, which would be quite funny to see. <laughs> but it is going to be an exceptionally hot day today. So these guys will be sitting in the shade for as long as possible. But this evening, every chance that they're going to get up late evening to go and see if they can find that buffalo that wasn't so far away from them. But my guess is that they're going to go towards Buffelswick Dam. They're going to go and find some water, have a little drink of water this afternoon. Well, this afternoon, maybe around 6 or 7. And then they're going to go hunting. And then after they hunt, hopefully they've got something to eat. And they, they walk their territories, scent marking. That is a fantastic thing to watch. If you've ever seen a lion scent marking, showing his dominance, showing his territory, it's great to watch that. But they are lying down under some quarry bushes to the left of them. Some nice thick thickets. Gwari thickets. And the two types of gwaris that we get here are the magic gwari and the natalensis, natal gwari. I think the names of the scientific names of the two different plants are Euclea dividorum and Euclea natalensis, the two types of gwari bushes that they're sleeping under. And they, you know, they've been told, it's told that you can use, I think it is the magic quarry, you can use that as a toothbrush when you're out here in the bush. So in case, you know, they feel like brushing their teeth, the lions, 
can break off a piece of that quarry bush and brush those. And I probably do need quite a scrub after all the all the all the meat they've been eating. <laughs> We've also heard all sorts of birds. Look at this, we found them. Check my baboons. Look, sub adult is watching us. We're very far away. Because they're a bit nervous, we decided to keep our distance. <laughs> Look at them. They're up in that Scotia. Oh. Weeping boar bean. So, keeping an eye on us, we heard a little bit of screaming again, so we came back. They've been obviously chasing each other around, and it was probably a little naughty adolescent like that that was being screamed at. So cool. I love it. baboons have this guilty look on their face like they've just done something wrong or they're about to do something wrong Linda in Canada is saying what do you do with you on foot by yourself amongst 40 baboons it said she said it happened to her in Victoria Falls now, the Victoria Falls baboons are very badly behaved baboons, but we'll discuss that a little bit later. Well, normally they would run away from you unless they've become very used to people like those <laughs> scratch, 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 got fleas. Uh, baboons at Victoria Falls. Now, a baboon, a big male baboon's canines are longer than a lion's. And, and of course, incredibly strong for their size. And they are very dexterous with those hands and feet. You can see how easily he moves and just sits on almost nothing. It balances perfect. Now, mostly out here, those baboons would run away from you at high speed. Those Victoria Falls baboons are, are so used to people and stealing from people. They actually steal people's shopping bags out of their hands as you walk through the town of Victoria Falls. Now, it's a very strange thing. Those baboons will take a lot more chances with females so with human females they will be far more brazen aggressive and uh, than they will with a male and they can actually from scent pick up the difference between man and f and woman so they know that it's easier to try harass a woman to steal something from her than it is from a man who's more likely to fight back so we've been sitting quite far away for a little bit at sea if we can sneak a little bit closer, hopefully they don't disappear. So I'm doing the same thing I would do uh, as I would uh, with an unrelaxed male leopard. I've stopped far away. I've started the car, let them get used to the sound. I'm just going to move forward very slowly. So a lot of you are very excited. This is the first time seeing baboons on Safari Live. It is my third time, but only my second time putting them on camera. So I'm very excited as well. And they are such awesome creatures. Maybe we can push our luck a little bit more. What do you think, Brian? Let's try. Let's try. Let's get a little bit closer. Okay. Don't run, don't run, don't run, don't run, don't run. You see a few adolescents there. Oh no, don't disappear. There's one peeking around the base there. So if we sit here, they might get curious and come closer again, especially if we're not showing any sort of signs of threatening them. He's got something in his hand. <laughs> I love it when they do that. Sit, hand over the knee. Very human-like in their gestures. Oh, 
down we go can't see any more let's just try and sneak forward again Anybody's wondering why in certain baboons their bottoms are very red. It looks like they've moved off into the bush. Oh, well, anyway, that was very exciting. But Anna Marie that is a sign of estrus in females. So when their uh, bottoms and genitalia become sort of inflamed, so they swell and become really, really red, it's a, it's a sign for the males that they should be on the job making the next generation of baboons. That was really, really wonderful. Uh, definitely the best sighting of baboons I've had uh, of the two we've had on live safaris. Now, the first time I saw was a baboons was just after I started, but it was at a distance. And they were around the Vuyatela Lodge. And that evening, we found Kunyuma with his own baboon in a tree. So he caught one of them. Now, leopards will hunt baboons, but it is a risky business. They're incredibly strong, and those canines are incredibly long. And it's normally only male leopards that will hunt them regularly in the Sabi Sands. But in areas where a lot of natural prey has been removed, so there's not many impala or dica or, or, or other things for them to hunt, uh, even female baboons will, I mean, leopards will specialize in hunting baboons and I've seen it happen and I've seen them do it at night by panicking the baboons in a tree and trying to pick off a youngster or, around their edges. Now, a lot of our regular viewers will know about the lions and the baboons, a story I've told a few times. And oh, just quickly before I delve into that, Natasha and Taurus says, Awesome, fine, killer bees. Oh, yes. Uh, so, Natasha, thank you very much. <laughs> so, I was telling a story, probably my best baboon sighting I've ever had was in northern Botswana. And the way to tell the story, I have to, I have to claim, is not my own. I inherited this. I was, I was there, fortunately. There was a great, great guide who unfortunately passed away, who I grew up with in Botswana, called Steve Kualatala. And we watched a troop of baboons. They were slowly moving through the Okavango floodplain, and a pride of lions stormed them. And I was eight, nine baboons didn't make it to the edge of the tree line. They made it to a termite mound that had one big jackalberry and two small fever berries on it. So seven of the baboons got it to the big jackalberry and most of them were females and sub-adults and the two big male baboons were sitting in these little fever berries which were probably not much taller than this. So and probably a very similar size to this russet bush willow here. So not very high. So if a lion wanted to they could jump up and grab them out. They sort of sat very quiet and still like this. Now baboons make a lot of noise and they shout quite a lot. So as Steve told the story the first time, and it's quite difficult to tell the story without laughing. So we saw this happen. And then um, Steve now said, we must think about it from the baboon's point of view. So basically an alarm call goes out and they all scatter for the trees. So not all the baboons know exactly where the lions are, etc. So the one babo baboon, there's Lion! The other one goes, Wah! The other one's there! Lion! Where? There! <coughs> so they keep shouting at each other. And then they realize some of their friends are stuck in the middle of this floodplain with these lions. So one baboon on the one side goes, Jump! The other baboon goes, No! 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 Don't jump! And they keep shouting at each other like this. Eventually, baboons shouting jump got food to the females sitting in that jackalberry and one female superman sort of like boom out of the tree and uh, before she even hit the ground 
the lioness was on it. Now, these two big males who were in the very low tree had been sitting very quietly curled up like this. Uh, suddenly, the one started shouting, No! No! Stop! 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 And another lioness saw him and just leapt and took him by the claw with the claws and pulled him straight out of the tree and killed him. The other male, literally, I've, ne I've never seen a baboon do that since. The other male just pretty much did this. He closed his eyes, put his head between his legs, and did not move. The rest of the seven baboons in the, uh, oh sorry, six now, one's been eaten. The six baboons up in the jackalberry over the course of the next 45 minutes all listened to, to the, 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 the bad advice of jump and all got eaten by the lions. The only one to survive was that one big male who basically tucked his head between his legs, put his arms over and tried to pretend he was in a happier spot. Yeah, that was probably my best baboon sighting and uh, it was absolutely amazing. Jump! Don't jump! It is, it is funny because also when you watch baboons, you can you can almost see them saying, Lion! 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 And then the other one's going, Wah! 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 So it's, it's quite funny if you try to figure out what they're saying. So it is, it, it is a, they are fascinating animals. And it's a pity we don't spend, uh, get to see more of them here on Juma. So enough about talking about lions and baboons. We've seen the baboon. Now let's go back to look at some more of those lions. One of them's actually open, just open his eyes there. Try to get a focus of there. Oh, he was just there. Look, see if you can see his eyes. He was just looking straight at me now. Wow, so apparently you've been listening to a cool story from Brent about baboons and lions. Now you are with a big, big lion. I couldn't be more relaxed than this. Sitting in the sunlight, taking their time, getting the rest they need and the energy they need. Wow, Ellen Fowler has just updated me with some of the interesting things that they've been doing out there. They were quite nice, innocent young boys about a year ago, and, and since then they've they've been killing quite a few of the other the other lionesses from the Inkuhumas, and they sent one of the males. So one of the males that was growing up in the Inkuhumas, I think his name's Junior, which I'm still to meet. He went running off uh, after after they after they came and attacked the three of them. And I think, it, so if that's right, they killed three of the Nkuhumas. So what's left of them is only five. And Junior was was the male lion that then ran away after that. That's, that's fascinating. Thank you very much, Ellen Fowler, for updating me with that. I can imagine they were quite innocent young boys and playful and used to hunt on all sorts of things. And now they've grown into themselves a bit more relaxed, well not relaxed, rather just adult-like, taking on the responsibilities of an adult, marking their territories and looking after each other. They each have each other's back so that they can defend this territory. Wow. So interesting when you go into the dynamics and the behavior of the lion, just even just, yeah, from a, from a point of view of how lions work as a team and that social organization is fascinating. I mean, even from a biomimicry point of view and learning about the, the, that whole pack mentality, you know, they even saw, I think there's a paper that was written around how to you know, develop business strategies much like the way in which lions work as a coalition. Ooh, one's getting up. Yo, look at the power on this lion. Big manes. Once, 
Looks like he's got a bit of a limp. So, it's good to meet you. Let's see if we can get some distinguishing features from each of you. I mean, they, they all look very, very similar. It's quite difficult in this light. If we just go over the one right in front here, let's see what we can learn from you. Scrapper and Blondie. Two of them are called Scrapper and Blondie. The one right in front of us looks quite blonde, but I can't see all of them, so I can't put them in contrast to one another, but that could be Blondie. Who knows? Do you guys know which one this one is? If so, please hashtag Safari Live. Sam, this is Scrappy, or hashtag Sam. Uh, sorry, not hashtag Sam. Uh, okay, so Scrapper was very thinny, uh, skinny, not thinny. <laughs> Scrapper was quite thin last time you saw Scrapper. Now that I look at it, this one here does look slightly thin. It could be a lot bigger. So they actually do look slightly hungry and they will be needing to feed. Well, so Scrapper has a scar by his eye. So what do we have here? I can't actually make out if there's a scar there. <laughs> so I don't think this is Scrapper. You could be Blondie because you've got blondish hair. But once again, I, I just don't know. We're going to have to see you another time. It's okay. We're going to have lots of time together, Mr. Birmingham's. And we'll get to know you a bit better. And I'll get to define my own way of seeing the difference between each one, other than Blondie and Skinny and all of that. That one is hiding behind a guari bush. And as just as we're finishing off, we were talking about guari bushes, and I, we're also hiding. I'm also trying to hide from the, in the shade of a guari bush because it is so hot out here. As you can see, I'm in the sun and I'm burning. So I got down into the shade of a guari bush, and this is the magic gory. The, what, the same one that the lions are lying underneath over there. I used to tell it was a, a magic gory because it, it looks like an M if you go like that with it over there. So it looks like an M. That's the way in which I learned the magic gory. And apparently it, it is to also clean your teeth. So I've never done that before. I just heard it while we were sitting with the lions while they slept. I thought, no, that's not going to work. Eh? <laughs> I've got a toothbrush at home. I'm not going to do that. But the lions could definitely think about doing it if they needed to, because there's one right above them. We're coming towards the end of our drive, and it's been a, it's been a great morning from the, the, the sun, the red, red sun this morning, that now is burning up the sky, creating a hot, hot environment. And that's why the, the lions are going to be sitting underneath. Chelsea from Utah is asking Cookie how uh, you thought the lions will spend time with the females, if that's correct. I think that's your question. The, the male lions will spend time with the females when they, when they, when they need to, you know, in terms of mating. They'll go and, and mate with the females when they are in estrus. Um, but also, they'll, they'll sometimes steal the kill of, a fe of the females. So they, they'll, they'll go hunting, or maybe the females will go hunting, and then the male lions will come and take over the kill and eat the kill of, of the females and the cubs and then leave. And sometimes the, the male lions will just join the pride for a day or two or a few days, but then it gets off on its own so a mission to mark the territory. So they play very different roles, the females and the males. The males will be looking and after the, the territory and, and showing dominance to other males and protecting the land for the females. And the females will be looking after the youngsters and growing them into the beautiful young males and females that they will become. With that, it's been a fantastic morning. I've thoroughly enjoyed my first sighting here with the Birminghams. Um, Dave, once again, we've seen so much together, from leopard, wild dog to lion, male lions. What a pleasure. What a pleasure. And um, 
Brent, thank you so much out there. It's been great. You saw baboons, which I know that we haven't seen for a while. And Kirsty behind the, behind the lens in the director's seat has been fantastic, giving me some great questions. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day, your evening, whatever you're doing. Much love and stay safe. And happy Earth Day. Look at this, a citrus swallowtail butterfly. Oh, isn't that absolutely incredible? You can see it's proboscis going into... Oh, I've forgotten the name of that flower now. Give me one second. <laughs> oh, I've gone blank. I do know it. Oh, I'll have to remember just now. Well, let's focus on the beauty of the butterfly while, while I try to remember the name of the flower. As I said, the butterfly is called a citrus swallowtail. The flower, I can't remember all of a sudden, but I will, I will try to remember before the end of drive, hopefully. But there's quite a few beautiful and interesting butterflies around at the moment. That's one of the bigger species we get here, the citrus swallowtail. Brian, if we come out a little bit, there's a skipper, which is one we don't really see. Um, so Heidi was requesting butterflies. There, you see that white spot in its wing? Come out there. There it is. To the right. There, that one. That's not one we see too often. That's called a skipper. You can see it's quite a different shape from the other butterflies, and they're very fast flyers, so they're quite difficult to get onto camera. And there's lots of different butterflies here. Uh, a butylon. A butylon is the name of the flower. Fortunately, it did come back to me. So Brian is just perusing. There we go. We've got some brown, oh no, African vagrant. Oh, isn't that just amazing? How wonderful is this new camera? Enables us to get that extra bit of zoom. Beautiful African vagrant. Oh, Brian, the challenge is on. If you come out, close to us, you see, there's a hawk moth. You got him. So, there we go. The middle of frame. Look at that! Oh, well, that's why it's a challenge. Where did you go? It's there, it's on the other side. A little bit lower. Look at that! Oh! <laughs> that's very similar to what you would call a hummingbird hawk moth in... Um, <laughs> in, uh, in, the, in the North Americas. Uh, but they are incredible. See <laughs> through. And they're so quick. Um, and that's how they avoid predators. But we'll have to show you in the book this evening. Oh, there's a, da there's a moth who stayed out a bit late. But from uh, the killer bees and from the rest of us here at Safari Live, what a wonderful morning it's been. Baboons, Temex, Corsa, Birmingham Boys, Ellie's big herd of buff. It's all happening out here in the African bush. And don't forget to join Sam and James for this afternoon's Sunset Safari. Bye.